Hi, this is Ryan Stegman, artist of Superior Spider-Man and the upcoming Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows, and you're listening to Amazing Spider Talk. Too many who know the angles, uncover and untangle all the questions and the webs left out to tangle. I'll be in 1962, last Wednesday's afternoon, they'll bend your ears with reckless self abandon The Amazing Spider-Talk The Amazing Spider-Talk Come swing through the air Sit back and prepare For the Amazing Spider-Talk Hello and welcome to the Amazing Spider Talk. My name is Dan Govazdin, and I'm the founder and editor of SuperiorSpiderTalk.com. And I'm Mark Chinacchio, founder of the Chasing Amazing blog. Dan does not read. And currently an editor at Superior Spider Talk. I do read it. It's just these things are not coming up in my feed. Well, anyway, uh, thanks for joining us, everybody, for a special Essentials episode of Amazing Spider Talk. This is the second to last one of these. Uh, we hope you enjoy this podcast and that it provides an intelligent conversation between two fans and collectors as we look at the Spider-Man comic universe in a bit of a bigger picture. Yes, Dan. And for this episode, we're going to be going all the way in the way back machine to a fun little year and called 2013, where Dan and Mark were just kind of flirting with each other online about doing a podcast together because... There was just this really dramatic status quo shift in the world of Spider-Man that just people needed to talk about. And Mark even Mark even wrote a blog post about how he might stop reading the book or stop collecting the book. Those were times. Those times happened. Anyway, yes, if you couldn't tell, this book, it's Dan's pick. It's called, it has a name. I didn't realize this was the name of it, My Own Worst Enemy, but you probably know it more as Superior Spider-Man Number 1 by Dan Long Game Slot and Ryan Stegman. And then we'll be answering your questions, and then after a very long absence, I think we're going to hear from Swarm today, Dan. Oh, boy. Every time he pops up in my Twitter feed, I think... This guy is going to find his way back to this show, and he inevitably does. Yeah, he was, uh, he's been tweeting out some interesting stuff lately. It'll be, he'll, he's going to come into this show almost like he's an evil mind coming to take over our good natured show. And on that note, let's talk about Superior Spider Man number one. <laughs> Dan, Superior Spider-Man number one certainly uh, caused a lot of havoc in the industry, but what makes it essential in your mind? That's a tough question because um, we've talked about Amazing Spider-Man number 700, which I think is probably the better comic. Would you agree with that? It's the more epic comic. Yeah. Um, You know, it's a lead up to Superior. This is probably the one that, like, should be essential over that one because this is the real, you know, first introduction to what we would be getting, you know, in in the pages of this book. Yes, before we'd seen Peter with Otto in his mind, but we had never seen Otto trying to be Spider-Man prior to this. And I don't think anybody had any idea what this book was going to be when they opened the cover to read what was going on inside of it. I mean, uh, it was the biggest question mark for me, maybe in Spider-Man history, like what would this book even be? Um, And I think that's kind of what makes this book so memorable and so interesting is that it, for all of its faults, and there are problems with this book um, that we'll talk about. I think Superior is likely to go down as one of the most memorable stories in Spider-Man's history. You know, outside of like the typical highlights, you know, like the the other ones that have become 
you know, the floating heads of guilt and, and things like that. Like, I think this is going to be a defining chapter. Like, you know, people grew up saying, oh, the Clone Saga. I was reading during the Clone Saga. But there will be a whole generation of people that, like, su- Superior is their, you know, benchmark Spider-Man story. Even if Slot has done his hardest work to try to erase the, like, legacy of his marquee (laughs) title but this particular issue i think is essential because it really lays out all the elements that would make superior a successful series in one issue you know it 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 shows that Otto would have a very unique voice and i think dan slot's best written character um it would have a variety of different and obscure enemies and i think that's something that like sustained throughout the run is that slot would dig into spider-man history to pull out kind of gem of, of enemies for him to fight. Um, uh, you'd have a nonstop, like, threat to Peter's legacy and this kind of constant sense of dread. Like, every page of Superior was like, uh, 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 turn, you know, turn at your own, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, warning. You had, like, beware what you find when you turn the page. And a kind of, like, a twisted sense of humor that showed up in this book. And also, uh, Ryan Stegman made his dramatic debut into the world of Spider-Man in this issue. And I think it was a huge, uh, like, artistic step into, like, a, you know, like, redefining step into what Superior would look like. This harsher, more, you know, like, uh, exaggerated Spider-Man. And I don't think we've seen that kind of art you know, like, uh, you know, artists launch onto the Spider-Man scene like this in a long time. Maybe not since uh, Todd McFarlane's debut. So, uh, yeah, those are a lot of the reasons uh, I think this is an essential book, mainly because this is, you know, maybe this and Superior 9 are, are the two issues that stand out truly from the Superior series. I'll never forget the anticipation I had towards picking up this I- issue like I had no idea how what I would be reading and how long it would last, and it's a feeling I've very rarely had in reading a Spider-Man title. So those are the reasons I feel like it's essential. I actually met Dan Slott the night this book came out. Wow. I, um, yeah, I mean, you know, putting aside the bumping into him in the neighborhood, I went to um, uh, was it the J J H Hanley Comic Universe, whatever, in Midtown? The one Manhattan. right by the time uh, by the Empire State Building. Yeah, yeah, and he was doing a signing, and that was kind of, and I stood outside, and not for nothing, this was the last, the first and last time I was like, okay, I, I can stand in line to get a, a creator's autograph, because uh, I stood in line for about three or four hours, and um, just to get his signature on this book, this like, and he was very very gracious. And he actually, you know, at that point he pretended to know who I was, which was fun. I thought that was great. Uh, <laughs> you know, ever since then, anytime I've at crossed paths with him, he's like, what? I don't know who you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, but no, Dan, I, 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 this is, this is a very interesting pick and I, and I, I'm not, that's not me trying to throw shade at it. Cause I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, Months ago, we talked about no one dies and we kind of, you know, my that was one of my picks. And I I, one of the reasons I picked it was because I kind of felt that best captured a lot of the themes of Dan Slott Spider-Man. But I mean, in a lot of regards, this superior number one kind of symbolizes how Spider-Man comics got its groove back to me because it became it was a hit after this. It'd be like like. I mean, 700 did very well, obviously, because, I mean, it kind of was predicated on, like, this major upheaval coming. But, like, Superior 1 and then Superior for, for many months that followed was the one of Marvel's It books. And when was the last time that Spider-Man was the It book for Marvel? Probably the Clone Saga. And I, I, I think that there is some significance to it. And I, I agree with you also. There will probably be, outside of maybe 700, no more memorable Spider-Man book that has come out from the last 20 years. I, I, I mean, can you think? I mean, maybe, well, maybe 20 years. 20 years is, is, a, is a lot. How about the last past decade? Yeah, I, I think easily the past decade. 
Because maybe um, one more day. Yeah. I mean, mem- memorable in like I mean, brand new day offered the opportunity to be superior number one. You, you right. know what I mean? Like that first issue had the chance of being this, and I think people were approaching that with a a, a different kind of dread than than this book. But this book succeeds hugely, whereas I think Brand New Day just alienated readers because it was yeah. like so similar. Yeah, and I liked that Brand New Day book for the most part, but um, yeah, this is this is really. I mean, yeah, Dan, it's got its problems, but I like this comic a lot. Like, this is this is a really interesting, unique, unexpected comic. To me, and, you know, power of retrospect and, and, and hindsight and all that, but, like, this to me, what we get from our main character, the main voice of the character, Spider-Ock is what we used to call him, uh, this is what this character should have and needed to be the whole time. And I don't think we got this character the f- for most of the run. I think we probably got him through that first main arc, which in- kind of ended at superior nine. Would you, is that, does that, would you agree with that? Like that kind of is like almost like a bookend to the first arc. I, on yeah. Superior? I, mean, I think the first nine issues of this story were by far the best. Yeah. Uh, of the story. And I think it was intended to be like nine issues. Like you superior nine could have had a very different ending where Peter wins that battle and fights his way back out. But the book was so hot. There was no way that that was going to happen. Yeah. And please, and and, and people got to remember too, that superior, the original concept for superior was just uh, like a long arc. It was going to be what, you know, Dead No More and Spider-Verse were before that happened, you know, like these six month long arcs. So it's kind of like the Clone Saga in that regard, too, except I think there's a little more substance to this. But, yeah, I, I do think the that slot loses the thread because, like, what I like about Otto in this comic is that he's not like the traditional anti-hero like the Wolverines and the, and the, um, the Punishers even like he, he is a warped. So maybe he's like the Punisher. He's a warped delusional villain who's trying to be a hero, but also just doesn't really know how and how to, doesn't know what's right and wrong any better. He just has like these impulses from in his head, you know, the remnants of Peter's memories telling him what to do, but he's still Otto at the core. Like he, there's no question. This is Otto Octavius as a, as Spider-Man, as Peter Parker. And, and like slot threads that needle so delicately here. And that's what makes this character turn so brilliant for me. Yeah. I love how Otto, like he, he basically improves on Spider-Man's weaknesses, which It's funny because the world reflects that too. Like the villains are expecting to take advantage of Spider-Man in one way and Otto is totally the opposite to the point that he flat out decides to leave a a, a fight sequence. Like I don't have to deal with this anymore. See you later. Right. Uh, And and like to me that's the defining moment is this character is totally changed. What the heck is going to happen? Uh, and, and we can talk about like the ending of this issue, how it kind of deflates that balloon a little bit. For what, 22 pages of this issue, we had no idea where this book was headed and, and what was going to happen. I mean, I think you and I were probably saying, Peter will be back, Peter will be back. But uh, the threat level was so high. Yeah, and, and like, not for nothing, I mean, we will talk about the ending in its own kind of spot here but this character that we were reading about was so engaging like i really wasn't like i i remember the first time i read this and then rereading this i wasn't looking for peter you know i was like who is this guy and what is he gonna do here you know what i mean like what is he doing like he's out with mj what's what's he gonna do you know what i mean like he's staring at mj's cleavage and and um Stegman's art, 
I love how he draws Otto as Peter. Oh, with like the kind I mean, of like, like cartoon <laughs> villain poses. Yeah, like it's just so much fun. And like I, we talked to Ryan about this. Um, not I'm not when we had the full conversation, but when I was at New York Comic Con and I got a couple of minutes with him, and he was just talking about like. He said that he just went out of his way to make Peter as obnoxious looking as humanly possible. Like there was no subtlety to it. Like, you know, like it was just what's the most bombastic over the top body language that I can draw. And he nails it. And this is I mean, Stegman, this is such a coming out party. I think he did do like one fill in issue of ASM yeah, prior to this. Yeah. The um, the Betty in the hospital issue. Yeah, but for the most part, I mean, this is his, like you say, this is his debut. Like, this is this is him doing Spider-Man, and what a weird, wacky Spider-Man to be doing. Yeah, the the takeaway image for me, other than, the, like, the hunched lab coat, you know, finger-pointing uh, Peter Parker, is right. the Peter in the restaurant with the headset and yes, the drink. Yes, and the glass and, of wine. Yeah, a glass of wine. It's like... I don't even know who this character is anymore, but I want to punch him in the face. Right. He's got such a shitty grin. It's amazing. Yeah. No, I mean, this is like, like I said, there's just so much to, to take away from this that just lasts with you. These images and these, these exchanges, you know, Peter insulting Max Modell about, you know, like, <laughs> Like, so we make weapons, but the weapons are good weapons. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, that's the uh, other thing is, too, is like this book is funny and Otto is funny in his own unique way. And and my mind, this is like slot at his peak is this character is so distinct and so fully formed, uh, like uh, slots writing. Even down to his, like, you know, obscure references to Spider-Man continuity, it all works and it's all additive. It's not, like, none of it is look at me, none of it is showy, none of it, like, none of it goes out of its way needlessly. It's very compact and even the weird call-outs all build to something. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about, I mean, I mentioned this in the beginning, this idea of kind of what Otto became as this story went along, the story being Superior Spider-Man, the series. Um, because I do think that there's a huge distinction between what he is in this one issue and through the first nine issues versus what after. And, and I mean, do you feel it was for the worse, the, the, how the character changed? Like, I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like he became more of this, like, traditional anti-hero. And I don't know if that was because the character became popular and Slot wanted to kind of service the fans and how he wrote him. Or if this was the plan all along to kind of show, like, an evolution of the character. But I and, – and, like, I also don't know how much of the character in this specific comic – you could read like how sustainable that would be over the course of a series, which is probably why it wasn't meant to be a series. But like, I just like how fresh this character is versus this kind of, Oh, you know, he's not a great hero, but you know, his, his heart's in the right place. And that's not what I don't think in this issue, the heart's in the right place. <laughs> Yeah, I I have less of a problem with it than you do. I think by the very end of the series, it becomes problematic, mainly because he finally has that heart in the right place. Like, I think taking actions that Otto wouldn't naturally take. Um, but I think about, like, the Shadowland issues and things like that where he's building this arsenal and on the side kind of romancing Anna Maria – um, mm. like I still continue to love this story. I think beyond those first nine issues. And I, I liked the auto kind of coming into his own as a person at, you know, as Peter Parker, as the story went on. But I think as we started to get into like venom territory and goblin stuff, yes, we really lost, um, uh, the character in those moments. Um, even the stuff with 2099, once it started getting bigger and moving like into bigger things, we started losing Otto uh, a, a bit in there. But I, yeah, I, I, I would, have, I, I would, have a problem with it. 
I, yeah, I was about to say, I think the thread started to pull away around the 2099 arc. Yeah. I think that's a fair, that's a fair, I mean, I don't think the issues between nine and 2099 were as good as those first nine, but they were still enjoyable. I still, and I liked the kind of twists that were being put on it, but like the, fr- like, but there was, like I said, there was just something so fresh about this character. Like I, I, I don't, I, I hate to just keep saying the same thing over and over without verbalizing it more specifically than that. But like I, I, it's just, you know, it's Spider Man. There's a, there's a familiarity with it to that. But like, you know, you, there is no single issue of Spider Man that I can think of that you open up and have such a distinct voice in it. He was never it, he was never this violent again. I mean, I think about the first even the first like two or three issues with blinding the vulture or punching the scorpion's jaw off or tearing into boomerang like he does in this issue where yeah. he's gonna flat out kill him and is stopped by the Peter Parker ghost, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh like he would never be that violent again. Like he early on in the series straight up kills uh, you know, the spider slayer or, or, you know, uh, like, you know, until he would come back later, but he straight up kills him. Yeah. No, I mean, it's brutal stuff. Um, and the sinister six here, I, you know, Dan, until I reread this, I forgot that the living brain was part of that new sinister six. It's kind of fun to go back and see the journey the living brain has been on. Yeah. But also the journey of that, of the, of that, assembly of the sinister six that you know of course nick spencer and then steve lieber made even more famous or infamous did they make fun of the living brain in that series ever i don't think they did because that's a missed opportunity <laughs> i think they took as many other opportunities as they possibly could in that series so yeah that's, i don't that's begrudge fair. them too much draw doom like one of your french women <laughs> <laughs> oh boy um, what do you think about the MJ stuff? Because that has kind of come under fire. Like people saying like, oh, it's really misogynistic and gross to treat the character like that. And I never had a problem with it. Like, because it's a villain. Uh, I know the kind of like rapey, you know, kind of second issue, you know, or was it the third right. issue? It was the second issue, which had like... Peter, well, Spider-Man kissing MJ on the cover, if memory serves. Yeah, and and doing things to his body while thinking about her. It's really creepy, but, like, it's a villain. Yeah. You know, in retrospect, could, especially considering how they paid it off, which was kind of like, it's not even like MJ ever expressed being mad at, Peter for his actions here. It was just more like, I'm just tired of the drama. I'm out kind of a thing. You know, that was the resolution. So like the payoff, there was never just the payoff was not there. So uh, to me, it makes it even seem more suspect in retrospect to even tease that. Well, that's the whole thing about this issue and it being an essential is the question of like the lack of consequences for the whole superior arc. Does that undermine, just like we talked about last week with the Harry Osborn coming back to life, you know, does the lack of consequences coming out of this story and how it's been handled ever since uh, undermine this story as an essential? Huh. Yeah, I guess, but... It's just, yeah, I mean, it depends on how far you, you want to take the essential idea from like, I mean, and this is your pick, mind you. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not, I, I, I'm in defending it. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but like, you know, when, when you're talking about just comics that give you a look through the window of what the heck is Spider-Man at a current point in time, you can't get more striking than this issue, this comic, you know what I mean? But in terms of playing the long game and looking at, uh, you know, how things have been paid off since, it really doesn't matter as much. It's not as important. Which is a shame. Like because it should totally be. Should've. It should be more important. That's the thing. This like this is so such a 
such a unique moment in time here. Like it's kind of stunning to me that the ball was dropped so hard. What, what is, and do, do you think that starts with the ending of this issue? Uh, like, do you think that that like playing it safe and revealing in the very first issue that Peter Parker was not fully gone is the kind of beginning of the look at a company that would be afraid to take as dramatic of a step. Yeah. I mean, again, this is an easy thing to say in hindsight, because this is like, if I go back to my original write up on this on chasing amazing in 2013, like I definitely celebrated that ending. Like I felt like, like just like after everything that, that, as a reader, I felt I had gone through like the previous month and a half with dying wish and, and 700 and like 700 being like, even knowing for the most part, how it was going to end. And we talked about this when we talked about 700, like that was one of the most stressful experiences I've ever had reading a comic book. <laughs> like it just felt stressful reading that book. Cause you just like, you, could, you just kept saying to yourself, how are we going to get to where we know we're going to get to, you know what I mean? Like, so having ghost Peter or astral Peter, as I used to call him show up at the end, it was kind of just like, like a bone to people who have been through the ringer of like, Hey guys, of course we're not, you know, we, we know it's comics and you know that nothing is permanent, but like, you know, just, just ride this out and you know, normal, there will be normalcy again at some point. And I, and I, and I felt like that was needed at that point in time. But now like going back and reading at it, it's kind of like, man, that was stupid. Like they should have just like, I mean, like if, if you granted, if the first appearance we had of Peter was like that great dramatic mindscape battle. And then like, you know, we didn't get him again until when we eventually got him again, which was during the 2099 arc, I felt like that would have totally sufficed. Like that would have like, okay, like, but in the moment, I guess I, you know, it worked for me in the moment. So they might, their instincts were probably right. Cause I just think it worked for a lot of people. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. Um, and I like the interplay for, you know, I mean, it is weird. First of all, to have like a blue glowy Jedi Peter hanging around. Um, and I'm sure we expressed that back on our very first episode of this show. Uh, cause he was not around long for our show. I think we did what three episodes with him in it, uh, where we discussed our first our first issue that we ever talked about were the cardiac issues. So I think that was like seven and eight, yeah. and then nine. Yeah, that was our first episode. Was seven and eight. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I like the interplay, like the, the whole idea that he can like physically restrain Otto, like a, a, as if it were Otto's mind causing him to hesitate. Is really mm-hmm. interesting, um, like almost like a Jiminy Cricket sort of way. Uh, this kind of conscious uh, that's keep holding him back. Um, I think that's interesting. But yeah, I, I think hindsight, it would have been more. I mean, I don't know how they would lo- have lost readers because of this, but like, could you imagine like turning into episode or issue nine and having them be like, "Here's a chance. Here's Peter's going to come back." And then have them really kill Peter again would have been a major slap in the face, but kind of awesome. Yeah, but uh, but I think I think they would have lost people after that. Yeah, I think that would have really hurt people. Like you know, it's there's, I know it's just comic books, but yeah, you, know, you can't you can't be intentionally cruel to your readers. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, and, and people could question that they have been, but I don't think they try to be cruel to their readers. I think they try to do what's best for the story. And I think they understood that if they were going to get readers on board with this new wacky status quo, there needed to be the hope spot, as I, I like to say sometimes, you know, like we need the hope spot. Yeah. Well, I think this is a really awesome issue. Uh, I mean, even if we just got the superior foes of Spider-Man out of it, uh, that's enough for me. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, so that's that's what I'm submitting for an essential, and I, I hope you guys dig 
this choice. Well, then, for our penultimate essential choice, I, I I think this was a really fun choice. I'm glad that you got me to reread this one. I haven't read it since 2013, so good times. I, I reread these issues like every day when they were coming out. I just couldn't get enough of it. Like I got it on my iPad, and I was like, "What can I mine? These are such great issues." And I've not really like found myself rereading Amazing Spider-Man after I'm done with it for the show, et cetera. In a long time, and and that says a lot. Good stuff, man. All right. Well, speaking of, um, I don't have a transition. Why don't we just get to the swarm song? S W A R M. S W A R M. A reanimated Nazi skeleton. A reanimated Nazi skeleton. Reviewing B titles while he's covered in B. He's permanently covered in bees. Actually, he's permanently covered in bees. He's coming for this podcast. He's coming for you. He's coming for this podcast. He's coming for you. It's time for Swarm's B title reviews. It's time for Swarm's B title reviews. So, Mark, have you read the latest report on BuzzFeed, our good friend Buzz on BuzzFeed? Dan, I t- how many times do I have to tell you I don't read fake news? I mean, what this honest, sad, horrible things is BuzzFeed saying now? Well, sources from inside Swarm's Hive are saying that he's been very unhappy with how this whole Promorsky Russian bee scandal has been covered. And he's been telling some crazy stuff on Twitter and even accused the former host of the Bee Book segment, Flash Thompson, of spying on him. Oh, boy, Dan. You know, as, as, as much as I don't think Flash is capable of that, I mean, I mean, sure, he's smart enough, but, I mean, doesn't he have some issues Wink, wink, glug, glug, if you catch my drift, that keep them from co- coordinating such a nefarious plot? Well, I mean, I, I, I hear they can hide cameras inside of, you know, beer cans now. <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, because Swarm is so unhappy, he's not going to come on to do this segment this week. Instead oh, of, yay! Yeah, 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 it's a good thing. Right, right. But uh, unfortunately, we are actually going to hear from him. We're going to cut away... Uh, from the podcast to a broadcast a few moments uh, from a fan rally that he's holding <laughs> in uh, Germantown, Maryland. Oh, is that, how close is Germantown to where you grew up, Dan? It's, it's actually like 20 minutes from where I grew up. <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, big Nazi bee population there, I'm guessing. <laughs> they're, they're swarming into town. So. <laughs> All right. Well, well, well let's, let's, let's get to it. All right. Let's go to fake news BuzzFeed for the video. <laughs> The elites and ruling class, the podcast, the podcast listeners. They don't understand that we're a movement. They're scared of our movement. They think by spreading their fake news about Primorsky bees and election hacks that they will weaken our hive. But our hive will only get stronger. They're just so embarrassed by how badly I beat their hand-booked people review host, Deb Whitman. I mean, it was a landslide. And that loser, Eugene Thompson, we don't call him Flash. Eugene, he can't get over the fact that he wasn't good enough to keep this gig. Isn't that right, Eugene? The elites that hate you will tell you Eugene is a hero. But he's just a guy named Eugene who wasn't good enough to have a show on a dishonest podcast. Now let me get... To amazing spider doc. All right, all right. I think we heard enough here, Mark. I, I, I don't know that I can listen to him bash our show. It's not oh. exactly how I want to spend my time. Oh, man, I thought he was just warming up. I, I thought he was going to say some nice things about us. Yeah, I'm sure he was, Mark. Let's, let's, let's move on. Let's talk about the conclusion to the first arc of Renew Your Vows instead. Let's bring some positivity onto the show. 
All right, Dan, that sounds good. That sounds good. I mean, you know, I'm a little I'm a little scared about what's going on in Germantown right now, but renew your vows. Um this has been a pretty solid B book. I mean, you know, is it even a B book? Is it is it a core title to you now? I I don't know, Dan. I mean, I, I, if I'm being completely transparent, I've basically canceled all of my floppies uh, and gone completely digital after the whole code thing. But I'm still picking this book up as a floppy because I just think it's great and I want to support it. And uh, I like reading Amazing Spider-Man as floppies. And in my mind, this might not be part of my collection, but like it's ama- as Amazing Spider-Man as anything else. Cool. Well, um, I mean, the first arc dealt with what, uh, like it was a Parker family versus mole man, which was kind of fun to like get a, 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 tr- a traditional Spider-Man villain in there. Um, although it was kind of funny that the first arc, if you remember way, way back, avenging Spider-Man was a mole man story. Um, I kind of like to lean on Mole Man a lot recently in the Marvel Universe. Like, I'm reading almost every book they publish, and Mole Man has shown up in, like, four different books, and Fing Fang Foom, who's showing up everywhere, too. And it's like, how are these characters, like, in Drax one minute and in Squirrel Girl the next minute? You know, like, uh, he's all the way in outer space chasing down dragon eggs, and then the next minute he's just living in the ocean. Well, I guess, you know, they don't have Fantastic Four to, like, kick around anymore, so they need to use their villains somewhere. Yeah, I guess that's true. But then, um, you know, and and I, I I like this book a lot, so this is not me criticizing. I mean, I, I think there is – there are some predictable elements to it, but in terms of kind of the family coming together and learning to work together and trust each other, I mean, I, I there hasn't been anything – through these first few issues that's like outwardly surprised me about this story yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I wouldn't say it's been tremendously surprising, um, but I, I think that's almost one of the, one of its uh, uh, virtues is that these characters seem so familiar and the way that behave is so appropriate to them that all of the new additions, like the spider, like, you know, copter that records them and, uh, and the kind of banter between Peter and MJ as husband and wife and parents. Well, like if we had just checked in on this randomly, it might seem surprising, but I, I think it's so consistently written with how we've known these characters to be over the years that like, it just feels natural. Yeah. Um, I guess this my thing is um, outside of the very kind of traditional super heroic drama that is going on. I, I, I do wonder where the ultimate tension of this book is going to come in. It, you, it would, does, you would have liked it to be a more dramatic step away from Amazing Spider-Man, you know, like maybe not superior Spider-Man level of drama, but like you want it to be a little more distinguished. Correct. Like, I mean, it's, it's familiar, but, and, and that's, you know, when you have a book like ASM is right now where Peter, and this is, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical of it, but I mean, let like, like, I think it's a fair assessment that the current Peter Parker, Parker Industries, Peter is pretty unrecognizable, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this isn't traditional spider-man and this is the traditional spider-man book with the added level of you know he's married again and he's got a kid but it still feels very kind of similar to something i've read 20 25 years ago um and and i i I, i'm looking for more of a hook we're already diving back into the goblin stuff yeah Um, I mean, and that's, again, not to take anything away from it. Like the most recent issue with like, you know, the Chuck E. Cheese riffing and stuff like this is, it's a funny book. It's a fun book. It's well-written. Stegman's art's great. I even thought I really enjoyed, um, the, the, the fill-in artist, the, uh, was it stock, what, what Stockman's first name? Nate Stockman. Um, who was from Spidey, right? That was, which, I mean, our, our problem with that book was never the art, right? No, no, no. In fact, the art was one of the reasons to pick up that book when it started. 
Yeah. Um, you know, like it's like it's it's a well illustrated book. Jerry Conway knows these characters inside and out, but I but I am looking for a more unique hook to it. Like I, I like like how is the book doing sales wise, Dan? I know you guys have been charting the sales for the last few months. I it's, mean, is it, 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 it's selling well, but it's not like, um, like, you know, breaking the sales records, you know, right. uh, I, I think, yeah, I think people, you know, probably jumped in for an issue or two. And we're like, okay. And it is, it is like any other B book. It's meant to appeal to a specific spider fan. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll see, you know, they're moving into like X-Men stuff, which is a weird place to go next. And they recently solicited a cover with MJ using the Venom suit. Um, and maybe that gooses some sales a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm talking about the book itself. Like, I really liked how the first arc chose, a, like, each issue was, like, a, uh, a different character's perspective on the same event. Um mm. You know, I could see that really backfiring, you know, and getting repetitive. But I thought that Jerry Conway made it really exciting and it really yes. helped differentiate these characters. Like it may not be hook level, but like in terms of longevity of the series, I feel like doing something like that is almost essential to really getting people to invest in these characters and in the concept of them being – superheroes you know you could ask us to buy into any you know just putting on a spider-man costume and swinging around town but or you could really get us to invest in her journey no i mean it, it was a unique element to the story and again this is not me saying i don't like this story i like it a lot it's 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 one of the books i look forward to especially now with spider-woman not being around anymore and spider Gwen kind of being mired in miles verse for the last few months. Um, and, um, you know, some of these other B books have just like, you know, part of the reason why we've changed our format, Dan is it's just, it was getting too difficult to get up and talk about some of these books. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, um, and it's, it's, it's very consistent. I, I, there hasn't been a dip in anything yet. Um, but just again, kind of, I mentioned this even like when we talked about the very, very first issue, like I am waiting for kind of like that next level. And I'm, I, I'm starting to, I guess, get concerned that there may not be a next level. I think this is just kind of where it's going to exist. And if that's the case, that's fine. It's a good book. I love it. It's great, but it, it, it'll, It'll never become like an all timer for me if it just kind of maintains this kind of even keelness. Yeah, really like feeding on your nostalgia. Uh, like, do you think that's where it's operating mainly right now? Is like this is just a nostalgia book? Yeah, I think I and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, again, especially when the main Spider Man universe is kind of doing its own distinct thing so much and maybe distinct isn't always better but um but yeah this is definitely scratching that itch for people who want something new like you know like i you know rather than countering the argument of we'll go back and read your old comics if you want to see a mary peter i mean we're giving us like the new adventures but at the same token like there's nothing that about this that's giving this real stakes Beyond the fact that it's a nostalgia itch. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it, it, it's the counter to, uh, like, you know, uh, as much as we complain about Slot sometimes, you know, he does jam pack his books and he does take dramatic choices, which ends up something like Superior Number One, but it also ends up with something like, you know, this Volume Four, which we're hot and cold on, you know, uh, or even, you know, the clone conspiracy or, or something like that, you know, and, and there's, there's definitely a conversation to be had between the consistent, you know, runner who runs the same pace, the whole race and the person who sprints off and on, you yeah. know, uh, and, uh, I'm just thankful that something like that even is, is exists right now when a lot of Marvel just seems to be, Event, 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 
How do we move these characters? How do we change them? This seems to be a book that, I mean, it's only five issues in. It seems to be a book that's very content telling the story that it wants to tell about these characters. Definitely. All right, Dan. Well, these are the B book reviews. So why don't we uh, get to the goodbyes? Sure. All right. You can find all of our new Amazing Spider Talk and old Superior Spider Talk podcasts over at superiorspidertalk.com or find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and also on YouTube where you can search for us by looking up Amazing Spider Talk. And if you do, please be sure to leave us a rating and a comment. They help us grow as a community, and we will also just love to know what you think about the show. And uh, if you have any opinions on the comics we talked about today or any questions, please be sure to email them to us at AmazingSpiderTalk at gmail.com or call our phone line at 9RedGoblin. Or you can even tweet at us at ok to print or whether hashtag ok to print and we'll address and read those on the air as well. That's a lot of getting in touch and with, Dan. Yep, we, we're all about touching other <laughs> people. Touching me, touching you. There we as go. Neil. Um, anyway, also be sure to check out both of our Facebook pages and subscribe to our brother podcast, The Ultimate Spin, to keep up with the adventures of Spider-Gwen and Miles Morales. Uh, next episode, we'll be back talking about Amazing Spider-Man number 26, I believe. But until then, Dan, where can we find you on the Internet? Yeah, you can find me over on SuperiorSpiderTalk.com or follow me on Twitter at, at sup. Spider talk. Not not a lot going on with me on the internet these days, but you know, tons of things coming down the pipeline, including my comic book that I'm working on. But more details on that later. Mark, you've got your yeah. book coming out. Come yeah, yeah, soon. yeah. Please uh, uh, pre-order my book. Uh, 100 things Spider-Man fans should know and do before they die. It'll be out in June one. Um, you can find that on the publisher website, triumphbooks.com, or on all major book retailers. Uh, also, there's a Facebook page for it uh, under 100 Things Spider-Man. So, so look that up and like it if you want updates about the book and where I might be making a, uh, appearances and whatnot once we get closer to June 1. Um, also, uh, you can find me on superiorspiretalk.com. You can find me on chasingamazingblog.com. And, of course, you can find me on Twitter at chasingasmblog. Dan, what Uncle Ben stuff you got for me now? Yeah, Mark, uh, I was thinking the other day about that time that you got that new car and everybody really like roundly criticized you about it because it was really just one big wheel. Uh, and, uh, you know, as ne neat of an idea as it was, Mark, I think some of that criticism was uh, certainly valid. Yeah, well, you know. The, the original origin of why I got this one big wheel was, you know, I was trying to get back at um, one of my nemesis's nemesis, who was this guy who would like go around on like a like a rocket powered skateboard that stole some inventions from me. Oh, man. Um, yeah. Know you know, is. What a jerk. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, so <clears throat> it was actually um, the, the the big wheel was was. Um, my uncle Ben's invention and you know, he, he didn't like that little skateboarding punk either. Um, so he's like, you know, why don't we engineer this single wheel? And, um, I, I, I thought this was an impressive idea. And, and, um, you know, when, when uncle Ben was working on it, you know, we had, Dan, I mean, it was so, so, so sudden we, we had the wheel up on like the lift and, um, you know, Uncle Ben is like working underneath it. And I bet I, I bet you you think what's going to happen is the wheel fell on him and crushed him. Right. I would never think that. I, I always hope for the best for Uncle Ben. He's going to make it out of this one alive. No. Nah, well, no, nah, he, he, he was fine. The, the wheel didn't crush him. But, um, you know, it did kind of like spring a leak. Uh, of some oil. And uh, my Uncle Ben uh, went to get a couple of. um rags uh oil and uh you know we wiped up the oil and dan he you know this is a this is a lesson to be learned about fire safety my uncle ben just threw all the rags in a box in the garage poorly ventilated 
And I mean, do you know what happens when you have poorly ventilated, oily rags uh, in a in a in a zone, in, you know, in like a garage or something? Uh, wild chimpanzees are attracted to it and tear your face off. No, Dan, it's 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 a fire hazard. It's highly flammable, oh. and like you know, all of a sudden, like you know, I left to go. Uh, you know, get my equipment for the big wheel and I come back and the garage is on fire because of Uncle Ben's oily rags from the frickin' big wheel. And I'm like, oh, now, now I'm never going to get to ride this thing. And as my Uncle Ben was burning to a crisp, this is like the second time in as many weeks that Uncle Ben is burning. I mean, first it was the microwave rays from um, the girlfriend when I was a teenage girl. Um, How but, could I forget? Yeah. Right, right. But now it's it's from oily rags in the big wheel garage. And of course he shouted out, with great podcasts must also come Amazing Spider Talk. That makes a lot more sense than my chimpanzee guess. Don't don't miss the next installment.